Hi folks, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. We're looking at Eusebius and the Gospels. Um, the book is The Living Christ and the Four Gospels by R.W. Dale. And uh, it's just a particular scholarly passion that I have about the Four Gospels and uh, their historical veracity. And this is a, a chapter in the book that we're going to look at. I'm going to read it and then just talk about bits here and there as we read um, what he said. So, without further ado. In the argument which I propose to submit, says Dale, to you to show that the story of our Lord contained in the four Gospels is the story which was told by the original apostles. It may appear at first sight, though, this is an error which I oppose to remove, that no evidence drawn from writings belonging to the second half of the second century can have any weight. But the whole amount of the Christian literature produced between AD 150, apart from the books of the New Testament, seems to be to have been inconsiderable or considerable of that which was produced a large part has unfortunately been lost. Enough, however, remains to give the gospel solid and secure support. And the lost books are not wholly unknown to us. Early in the fourth century, an eminent scholar and famous bishop, Eusebius of Caesarea, wrote a history of the church from the apostolic age to his own. And in this, he gives many extracts from writings which have long disappeared, uh, though copies of some of them may perhaps still lie hidden in Eastern monasteries and yet be, re re be recovered. Eusebius was born not much later than AD 260. The place of his birth is uncertain, but he submitted to the Council of Nicaea a confession of faith which he said that he had been taught at Caesarea when he was a child and why he was a catechumen. His early associations with that city, there he was baptised and there he became a presbyter, and there too soon after AD 313 he became bishop, and he was bishop of Caesarea at his death at AD 336 or 340. In his youth, he was the friend of learned men, especially of Pamphilius, a fellow presbyter, who was a passionate disciple of Origen of Alexandria. He had access to great libraries, the library of Pamphilus, which was of extraordinary extent and value, and the library collected during the first half of the third century by Alexander, Bishop of Jerusalem. His injury must have been immense, and he published more than 30 treaties, historical, Apostol apologetic, doctrinal, critical and exegetical, besides orations and sermons. His great position at the Council of Nicaea was due, no doubt first of all, to the intimacy of his relation with the Emperor. He alone of the Eastern prelates could tell what was in the Emperor's mind. Quote, he was in the clerk of the he was the clerk of the imperial closet, he was the interpreter, the chaplain, the confessor of Constantine, end of quote. But he was also beyond question the most learned man and the most famous living writer in the church at the time. Before the meeting of the council, he had intervened on behalf of Arius and had remonstrated with Alexandria of Alexandria for deposing him. By the more vehement enemies of Iranianism, he was regarded with great distrust. When the, the creed of Caesarea, which he proposed to the council, had been modified, by the introduction into the Nicaea Creed of the cause declaring to be of the substance of the Father, begotten not made, and of the same substance, homo usion, with the Father, Eusebius hesitated whether he should subscribe to it. He did not like the new terms. The old creed of his baptism was sufficiently explicit for him. Nor did he like the anathema appended to the creed condemning Arianism. But after a day's consideration, he signed with the rest, and in a letter to the people of Caesarea, he explained that, quote, though he would resist to the last any vital change in the traditional creed of his church, he had nevertheless subscribed to these alterations when assured of their innocence to avoid appearing contentious. End of quote. The truth seemed to be that he was a man tolerant of theological differences, Profoundly, profoundly convinced that neither human language nor human thought can define the mysteries of the eternal life of God, and he was very reluctant to deal hardly with harshly, hardly with friends of his who had been caught up by the bold speculations of Arius. For himself, he had the traditional faith, but he did not see that Arianism cut it up by the roots. 
if we were to describe him in the current language of our own times we would say that he was a broad churchman orthodox but not inclined to be rigorous in exacting from other men a, an acceptance of the orthodox definitions and that in his intellectual temper and habits he was a scholar and literary man rather than a theologian in his time there were seven of the books included in our new testament about whose apostolic authority the opinion of the church was divided and in writing his history eusebius proposed as one of his objects to make some contribution towards a decision of their claims the book of the new testament as you know were written by different authors in different countries at different times there are many questions to be asked about them there um, when were they separated from all the christian writers and play and, and placed in a class by themselves as being sacred scripture or of the christian faith by whose authority was the selection made and on what grounds were some books finally included others finally rejected these are subjects which you will find discussed in histories of the new testament canon from such treaties you will learn that towards the end of the second century but at least as early as AD 185, a unique and sacred authority was attributed to nearly all the writers contained in the New Testament. Quote, the scriptures are perfect in as much as they are, were uttered by the word of God and his spirit. End of quote. This is the testimony of Irenaeus. By the scriptures he means the books of the Old Testament, and with a few inconsiderable exceptions, about which opinion was divided, the books of the New with these exceptions, our New Testament books have been received by the Christian Church as authoritative and sacred for at least 20 years before the close of the second century, and they were regarded by the Christians of that age with a reverence as deep as our own. For Christians of the generation to which Irenaeus belonged, Christians living in every part of the empire, our four Gospels, no other Gospels, contain the authoritative story of our Lord's life and the authoritative record of his teaching. Our Acts of the Apostles, no other Acts, contain the authoritative history of the early years of the Christian Church. They accepted the Epistles of Paul, which have a place in our own New Testament, the First Epistle of Peter and the First Epistle of John, and containing the authoritative teaching of the Apostles who spoke in the name of Christ. These, are, these books have been separated from all others, not by the decree of a council or in submission to the judgment of a great theologian, or bishops, but by the general consent of Christian churches in every part of the world. The process had been a silent one, no one can tell how the results have been brought about. But it is certain that about the year AD 180, the books which I have enumerated regarded as, were regarded as Christian scripture, as books written under divine inspiration and having divine authority, and they had their place side by side with the books of the Old Testament. Concerning the epistles to the Hebrews, the epistle of James and Jude, the second epistle of Peter, and the second and third epistles of John, there was not, in the early age, the same unanimity of judgment. The apocalypse, which was generally received at the close of the second century, was regarded with serious distrust in the third. The apostolic origin of some of these seven disputed books was acknowledged by the churches of one county and denied one country and denied by the churches of another eminent scholars and bishops differed among them no attempt was made for a long time to determine the question by authority eusebius as i have said proposed in his history to make some contribution towards the settlement of the claims of these disputed books by showing what he had been made of them in the early ages of the church he also proposed to report anything interesting that he might discover concerning the books which were universally received by the church but he draws a very clear distinction between the way in which he intends to deal with the two classes of writings he promises that if he finds in any church writer a quotation from a disputed book or a reference to a disputed book he will call attention to it every such quotation or reference would illustrate the authority which the book held in the judgment of an earlier generation of christians and would assist to determine its claim to be included among the sacred writings but to give quotations from the undisputed books and references to them was unnecessary the authority of these books was not doubtful it was universally acknowledged if however he found in early christian writers 
any interesting statement or information either about the book which were universally received or about the author or the seven he promised to give it place in the history his general principle would not have required him to call attention to any mere references to the first epistle of john first epistle of peter their genuineness had always been acknowledged but as a matter of fact he does call attention to the references to those epistles which are found in some early writers he may have thought says dr lightfoot that this would conduce conduce to a just estimate of the meaning and of silence in the case of disputed epistles to Peter 2 and 3 John. Eusebius was a man of large learning. He had accessed some of the best libraries of Christian literature that existed in his time. Many books which are now lost were in his hands, and from some of them he gave interesting important extracts. It was his declared purpose to collect and to record whatever information he found in early Christian writings, both concerning the the seven disputed books and the books which had secured their place among the sacred books of the church. He was a fair-minded man with instincts and habits of a scholar, but throughout his history there is no hint that any uncertainty ever existed in the church with regard to the authority of the four gospels. There is nothing to suggest, to suggest that they had first appeared after the death of the men whose names they bear. It is inconceivable that Christian churches independent of each other, inheriting different traditions and situated in different countries, but have come to accept these four books as the genuine writings of Matthew and John, Mark and Luke. If they had appeared for the first time and without explanation when Matthew and John, Mark and Luke had all passed away, and if any explanation of the late appearance had been given, it is also inconceivable that no trace of it would have survived in the Christian writings which have come down to us, there is no hint of any such explanation. If any hint of it had existed in the writings which are now lost, but which Eusebius possessed, he would certainly have told us about it. Take the Gospel of John. If a book of such immense theological importance as the fourth Gospel had appeared for the first time 30 or 40 or 50 years after John's death, can we imagine that its claims would have been unchallenged? Would no church writer have expressed a wish for some account of its history? Would no question have been asked as to the reason why, if it had really been written by the apostles, it had not been given the church 30 or 40 years before? Down in the middle of the second century and later, there were Christian bishops living in different parts of the world who, in the early years, had known John or the friends of John. Would they not have wanted to learn how it was that the gospel of which they had never heard had appeared with John's name? And would not the unknown writer who had the courage to attribute his fiction gospel to the apostles have also had the courage to give some fictitious answer to these inquiries? Would not the miraculous ingenuity which enabled him to write a story of Christ which during so many centuries has commanded the wonder and awe of mankind have been equal to the invention of a tale concerning the manner in which the book had been preserved and the grounds for delaying its publication which would have had irresistible fascination and charm, a tale far too beautiful and too pathetic to have passed out of the memory of the church. If any questions about the book had been asked, if any answers had been given, Eusebius would have told us about them, for he promises to mention what had been said by earlier writers concerning the undisputed books, as well as about the disputed books. He makes a specific promise to mention what they have said about the four gospels, but any of such inquiries as those I have suggested about the Gospel of John, of any explanation as those inquiries must have drawn out, he says nothing. That this Gospel would have been received by the church without controversy if it had appeared 20 or 30 years after the death of John is incredible. When we consider the contents of the Gospel itself and the controversies by which the church was harassed throughout the second century, Gnosticism destroyed the power of the gospel by changing it into philosophy by those who were contending earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. It was regarded with intense hostility. But among the technical words of this formidable heresy are the words which hold so conspicuous a place. John's gospel only begotten life, truth, grace, fullness, word, light. Did the Gnostics get these words from John, or did the unknown writer of the four gospel get them from the Gnostics? 
The words are just characteristic of the gospel attributed to John, as of the system taught by Valentius the Gnostic, though in John they have a different power. Who used them first, the writer of the fourth gospel or Valentius? If the fourth gospel had appeared for the first time at any date after 120 AD, what chance would it have had of being received by those who were fighting Gnosticism as the deadly foe of the Christian church? To take a parallel case suggested by Professor Solomon of Dublin, suppose that when the controversy of the Reformation was at the hottest, it had been announced that the manuscripts of the Epistle of Paul, previously unknown, unknown, had just been discovered in some ancient library. Suppose that when the manuscript was published, it was found to be full of such words as transubstantiation, purgatory, indulgence. Would not every Protestant have rejected as a forgery? Suppose that the epistle had been published and accepted as genuine 10, 20, 30 years before Luther nailed his thesis to the door of the church at Wittenberg. Would not the outbreak of the Reformation have provoked a fierce controversy concerning his genuineness? If the fourth gospel had appeared as late as 120 AD when Gnosticism was becoming very powerful, the churches which held fast to the traditional faith would never have acknowledged its authority. If at the date it had been only recently received as the work of an apostle, received within the previous 20 years and received an inadequate evidence, its authority would certainly have been challenged and some traces of the controversy would certainly have survived. I just want to say, you know, this issue about which came first, the Gnostic Gospels or John or John, and the Gnostic Gospels, that there was, there's was, there been a rubbish dump that was found in Egypt with thousands of manuscripts on it. I've documented this in other videos. And um, the Gnostic Gospels in the rubbish dump were generally small handwriting. And the main Gospels, I think there was three specifically that were found, were in large handwriting. And they realised that large handwriting was seen as public information they were read out in public and seen as important whereas the small handwriting was seen as pocket paper newspaper kind of writing so that rubbish dump clearly showed that the gospels were seen as authoritative uh, for public consumption reading in public space showing that john's gospel came first rather than the gnostics We go on. If the fourth gospel had appeared as late as 120 AD, when Gnosticism was becoming very powerful, the churches which held fast the traditional faith would never have acknowledged its authority. If at the date it had been only recently received as the work of an apostle, received within the previous 20 years, and received on ad in adequate evidences, its authority would certainly have been challenged, and some trace of the controversy would certainly have survived. But I repeat that in the Christian writings of the second century, which in our in our which are in our own hands, there is no trace of any controversy on the genuineness of John's gospel. And the silence of Eusebius assures us that there was no trace of any controversy on this subject in the Christian writings not now lost, which he found in the library of his friend Pamphilius, or in the library of Bishop Alexandria at Jerusalem. The inferior seems to me irresistible. There was never any controversy concerning the genuineness of the Gospel of John because there was never any uncertainty about it. And there was never any uncertainty about it because it was published in John's lifetime and all John's friends knew that it was his. Yeah, I think there's a... Um, Yeah, I think it's a clear argument. There's issues about Papias and his mentioning of John, which John is it? But uh, I think the argument still stands. There's no controversy about John in those first 200 years, which shows you that it was an established, established as an authoritative book amongst the Christians in the um, first and second century AD in Rome, in the Roman Empire. Well, we're going to go on and, and do uh, another one now. And uh, 
hope you find it a blessing and thank you for listening take care